chess. I don't know if you saw a chess this year. There was a, a competition. Uh, many people could uh, submit white box implementation of AS, and then people could also try to break it. And it was very impressive to see that most of the solutions could be broken uh, just in less than a day. So I think it would be very, very interesting to have Pascal's point of view for, um, for, for white box crypto. So please join me to welcome uh, Pascal for this invited talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're making me blush. Um, thank you very much, first of all, uh, to Tsuyoshi and Thomas for, for having me. It's an honor to address the Asia Crypt uh, audience. So what I'm going to talk about today is white box cryptography. I think it's a subject that has been largely overlooked in cryptography. Um, essentially, a lot of people think that, <clears throat> I mean, if you look at the, at the background in the literature, um, you can see that some papers have been, have been published on designs for white box uh, implementations, and all of them have been broken. So basically, when you talk to people about white box crypto, they're like they uh, roll their eyes and they say this this is a uh, snake oil uh, security this cannot exist uh, but actually I think there is a lot more to it and I wanted to share today uh, a few thoughts that I had recently about Wavebox crypto that I entitled, entitled uh, Wavebox crypto mania so um, first of all what is what is Wavebox crypto um, it's uh, not necessarily completely trivial to define what, what it is. So the concept uh, at a very high level is, is pretty simple. Um, and you can explain it to kids with a few words, or well, kids who know how to program. Um, so basically, when you take a, a cryptographic program, so we don't care exactly about the functionality. It could be a block cipher, it could be a signature scheme, it could be whatever. Um, you're, you have a program here, which is generic in the sense that it takes as input the uh, algorithm's input, like uh, the plain text, if you if you would uh, if you'd like to encrypt, uh, for instance. The key uh, has a separate input, and then you output, let's say, the ciphertext. So this program here is very generic, and this is exactly what you find in libraries. Um, so when we talk about white box implementations. Um, we're uh, kind of um, changing that paradigm to our code a given key into the program. So the program now is not generic anymore uh, towards the key. The key is completely fixed. It's hard coded into the code. But the program here is going to take any input and output the, uh, the, the correct output, but with that, with that key embedded inside. So it seems very easy to uh, explain and understand, uh, but usually there is some confusion between what white box crypto is, with uh, I mean, as opposed to what obfuscation is. And if you uh, think about general uh, purpose obfuscation, it's something that is way that is way stronger actually than white box crypto. Uh, for obfuscation, actually, we're talking about a transformation that. Um, o here that takes as input a program like any program and puts another another one obfuscated and what we want to hide is uh, uh, basically everything about the program like basically any property uh, that the program may fulfill we want to hide it and um, so in such a way that actually if you're given the obfuscated program there is no other uh, way for you to um, uh, I mean you don't have a choice. I mean, the only, the only thing that you can do is basically to, to execute it as if it were a, a black box article. And there is nothing that you can extract from the code uh, of OP. And so there is, of course, this, this question how realistic obfuscation is. I think the, I mean, the, um, uh, the paradigm of obfuscation has been around for, for years. Um, we still don't have, I mean, satisfactory solutions for that problem, and we also have uh, known impossibility results. But if you actually, if we come back to white box crypto, 
uh, we can see that it's, it can be seen as, a, as, as very different in the sense that it's way more restricted. So here, we don't want to hide any general program. Uh, basically, we want to uh, consider programs that actually code a certain, a certain function f. And f is a, basically a graphic primitive. So not every program can be a graphic program, right? So we're, what we're looking at is a very restricted class of programs. And uh, also, we don't want to hide any property, but just some, some property. Um, so, you, for instance, you don't want to hide that it's AES that you're using, you just want to protect the key. And so, um, so when, you, when you think about it and when you try to um, uh, basically model, model the security of white box programs, uh, there are some cases where, um, I mean, um, uh, viewing the code as a black box oracle makes sense uh, only in some contexts and not in others. And um, also, we, we do not know of any possibility result that would apply uh, in a very uh, general way. And, uh, but at this point, it's very unsatisfactory. I mean, because we don't know of any example of a construction, even for AES, for instance, that will be probably secure. Uh, so there's been uh, proposals, um, but basically they've been broken. And we don't know if, if white box crypto even just exist at all. So it's a very mysterious subject. Um, so you can try to approach this subject by two, in two ways, the practical side and the theoretical side. Um, and so the practical side, it's, it's a very, I would say it's a very active area uh, in the industry. Um, and um, there are some people in the industry who claim to have uh, secure solutions. And of course, they do not reveal the design, meaning they don't. They would not tell you how their white box uh, programs were designed and generated. Uh, this remains proprietary, but you can have access to the programs and you can try to reverse engineer them. And so uh, we've tried to with a white box contest. So it was uh, this year's uh, chess capture the flag event. Um, um, it's a competition that we co-organized. And it was about AES implementations. Uh, you can look it up. Um, the, the URL is here. There were 94 challenge implementations that were posted on the on the submissions uh, system. They all have been broken. Um, there was a considerable effort invested in there. Uh, two you two two hundred uh, people were like working day and night. Uh, you could see that uh, some implementations that were submitted were broken like uh, half, an, half an hour after. Um, and the longest uh, implementation has survived is 28 days, basically. And it was eventually broken by uh, Dunway, a PhD student at Crypto Experts. Um, and, then, uh, and then the adoring part was reached 406 strawberries, so there was a system of points with strawberry points and banana points. But Whatever. So if you were attending chess, probably you, uh, you know more about uh, what happened during the competition. There was a presentation on the ramp session. So but the, the conclusion of that is that everything that had been submitted has been, has been broken. And in the competition, you didn't have to reveal exactly how your challenge implementation was made. Uh, it's just you, you just had to provide it without exactly telling how it was designed. Um, and also the competition was anonymous to, you know, uh, invite people from the industry to uh, propose their own, their own challenge implementations. But the conclusion is that everything was broken and it's unclear to us, um, obviously, if, if uh, in practice we have, uh, there are out there uh, solutions, I mean, programs that would, that would uh, survive longer uh, than 28 days. And on the theoretical side, uh, it's still very unclear because we can define white box crypto um, in theory. Um, we can define security notions for it. Uh, but the, the big question is, um, I mean, there is the question of existence. Can we actually build the construction, even if it's theoretical, even if it's, you know, it's nothing to do with uh, practice? Can we have even just a, a single construction of white box crypto out of in this obfuscation, for instance, or can we do it the other way around? We don't know that. 
um, apparently there is no obvious connection between the two. So we don't even know if, if, it's, uh, if it's possible to achieve it. And it's, uh, to me, it's, it's one of the biggest uh, open questions. Uh, so I wanted to, to um, uh, usually when, when we talk about breakbox crypto, it's about block ciphers. Okay, so we're going to implement AES typically. And here I wanted to actually um, focus on something else, which is public key signatures. Okay, and I'm going to talk about public key encryption after, after that. So, um, so how does it work? So, of course, when we um, talk about the security of white box implementations, we're not talking about um, um, breaking a particular program, but breaking a distribution of programs. So the distribution, the, the programs that are output by a, a code generator, which includes the design and all the intricacies of how the program was generated. So we call that a white box compiler. So you, we have a, basically a white box compiler, but it, what is it exactly? Well, you generate a pair of keys uh, for your signature scheme, and uh, you just take this, the signing key, you can just give it to the compiler, together with some randomness, and, uh, and the public key possibly, you press the button, and then the code generator is going to give you uh, a program that unbates that key and that signs anything. And so, so again, I would like to stress, to stress the difference, uh, the big difference between a function, an oracle, and a program. And so a function is an algorithmic description of a mathematical object, it's in specifications, if you will. An oracle, oracles are what we use in global security. So oracles are basically uh, a process running somewhere in the sky. Uh, it can be uh, stateful, that is, it remembers over time all the queries that you make to it. Um, you can have only remote access. You don't know anything about how it's done inside. You just have input-output access to it. And uh, it can use some private randomness if it wants, right? So it's like you're interacting with something that is on the other side of the planet and you have no way of knowing what's going on in that process. All the internal variables and so, so on. And the program is, is completely different. So the program is, is basically a word in the programming language. It's a string, right? And so it is completely stateless because you can always reboot it you can always copy it, transfer it to somebody else. Uh, you can observe each and every internal variable. You can modify each and every internal variable. Um, and of course, assuming that the program is allowed to make some system calls, you can just capture uh, the system calls and simulate the system as you want and reply with anything of your choice. Right. So, a program is something that is in an environment that is, I mean, the program is, 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 is an object that, that is dreaming about being, being an oracle, but it cannot be an oracle because basically it's memoryless. So, it would just, you can just erase it, start it from scratch, and, and, and repeat. And so, it's completely different. So, if you will, this would be typically a smart card. You cannot open it if you assume that it's tamper resistant. And here you have executable software. And basically, you can, you can as an attacker, you have much more, much more power here than here, obviously. So, um, so first of all, I so there's a question of uh, whether it makes sense or not actually to try to have a white box implementation of a signature scheme. So basically, you would be given a program that embeds that art codes the signing key inside the program, and you give a, a message, it returns uh, the signature on that message. And so if you're given that program, uh, um, do you actually, I mean, what is the meaning of trying to extract the signing key from it? Because you're given the functionality, right? So, uh, but there's a response to that, which is, there are several, actually. So um, typically in a white box implementation, you would be given an implementation that is password protected. The same way a smart card that signs an email is pin protected, right? Um, so in the case that the 
when the when the program is password protected, it means at some point when it was generated, a password was given to the compiler, and if you give the correct password together with the message, you would get the signature. If you give something different, it would give you some uh, some junk, something that does not validate as a as a signature on the message. And so in that case, if you're not given the password, usually the password is there to protect against code lifting, which is the attack where the attacker remotely accesses your device, like your mobile phone, for instance, where the, the program is running, steals it, and tries to recover the key or you know, um, use the functionality. So, <clears throat> um, so in this case, actually extracting the key makes sense also. You can have what is called compressible um, uh, white box implementations where the code is voluntarily made very big, uh, very, very large, or artificially consumes a lot of RAM, for instance. And uh, you would like to actually extract the key so that you can um, perform the signature operation uh, much quicker or with less resources. Also, the code could be traceable in the sense that even if the same signing key is used, you can have several programs where um, uh, basically um, if so the, the different programs are given to users and if at some point you find one program over the internet you can incriminate one of these users so the code is traceable and you cannot remove the watermark um, and also you can have a restriction of messages for instance the program could just agree to sign messages that have uh, that are in a certain subspace or verify a certain format so, uh, so here I'm just going to assume that there is no password, there is no restriction uh, on the on the message space, um, but we're typically in the scenario where we're given an incompressible or a, um, traceable uh, implementation. Right. So, um, so now Schnorr signatures. So I guess you're all familiar with uh, with Schnorr signatures. Um, we use basically a group of prompt order Q. We're given a generator of this group, and then we um, we use a hash function basically to have the message the message together with a, a random element of the group, and then the, we compute the other part of the of the signature, and we have this verification equation here, which involves the hash function and the two parts of the signature S and C. Um, so it's known that Schnorr signatures are uh, basically existentially unforgeable in the random order model under the discrete block problem. We know that this is not true in the standard model, but we know that it's probably in the standard model probably a difficult problem to forge. Um, and um, so this is a very basic signature scheme, and I'm trying to look at what it, what, what, how we can actually um, implement it with a white box program and what happens when we when we want to do that. So uh, basically this is the uh, the Schnorr uh, signing procedure um, again. So we we take this random k, exponentiate uh, so g to the k, we hash that together with the message, get the commitment part of the signature, multiply with x the private key and then we subtract uh, that from k and we get the yes part of the signature. So basically, an implementation of Schnorr uh, signature uh, should resemble something like that, right? Except that everything here in this blue perimeter, we don't know exactly how it's implemented. It does functionally something equivalent to that, but it could be obfuscated. We don't know exactly what it does. So, um, but so wait a minute. So I said at some point earlier that if we're if we're given a program, we can simulate all the system calls, right? And here we're making system call, right? I mean, we're calling a random number generator to have our k value here. So, actually, the, what this means is that if we take the textbook version of Schnorr, and if the program really makes a system call to, to have this k here, we can just intercept that and put whatever value of our choice. And then if we put any value, we can recover trivially uh, the private key by just looking at a single signature. Right? So it means the, the textbook ver Schnorr signature scheme cannot be implemented as is. Right? We need to 
already we need to make modifications in order to ensure that it's realistic to try to have a workbox implementation of it. Um, so we can try to have to use a, uh, a pseudo random generator uh, inside the program. Um, obviously, if it depends only on a system call, again we can um, either I mean, if we know the PRNG, we can know this value. We need only one equation. If we don't know it, uh, but we uh, can call it on, on, uh, on, uh, on different messages, uh, there, is, there are two equations, and we can recover the key uh, as well. And so depending, uh, I mean, the program could, could create K as a, as a, as a, using a PRF on M, but it's not good e either, uh, because you can and if you can extract this function, then uh, your same attack applies again. And putting, so the only solution that seems possible is that the program actually doesn't, doesn't make any call uh, to, a, to an external source, but computes uh, uh, the, the random that it needs as a pseudo random, both in the message and in the private key. And in that case, we can assume that, yeah, it's, it's uh, um, I mean, a white box secure implementation could exist. Now, white box cryptomania. What do I mean by that? So, white box cryptomania is the place where the the program that signs, given the secret key, is safe and cozy. So, it's safe and cozy in the sense that uh, we have somehow. Uh, we have this security game, so I'm suppose I'm having an adversary here. I generate a random uh, key pair. I give to the adversary this public, the random public key, as well as a program that unbakes the secret key. Right? And I ask the adversary to uh, send me back the secret key. And if we, I mean, if we're in cryptomania, we believe that this is hard to do, right? So what we mean by cryptomania is that if we define this game here, played between the challenger and the adversary, uh, at some point we can claim that there is no efficient adversary that su su successfully does that. Right? So we don't know exactly why, but we assume at some point, maybe in the future, maybe in two years, maybe in five years, maybe never, maybe, I don't know. Um, we assume that we can prove we have a security proof, and we can prove that this this attacker essentially does not exist. I mean, cannot be efficient and have a, a non-negligible probability of success. So we have it. So now it means once again using the techniques of global security, we created something, an implementation that is probably secure. Right? We're in cryptomania, so we solve the problem. So now it means essentially that we can uh, we can distribute in the wild programs that are safe um, because you cannot extract secret keys from them. So it means basically that we solve the problem which is uh, enormous in the security industry, which is having tamper-proof software. So we can get rid of all the, this immense <coughs> zoo of, of secure objects, of trusted hardware, and we can essentially replace them with software, and because with some uh, magical way, we found a way to prove that this is hard to do, we essentially have the same security. So cryptomania assumes that, right? It's an assumption. I'm not telling you how to prove that, or how to design, how to do the to design the, the white box compiler so that you can prove that this is, this is hard. I'm just assuming that we have a compiler for which we have a proof that this is hard. Okay. So before I uh, go on, um, we need the, the classical security notions for signature schemes. Um, so basically, so there are plenty of different security notions, but there are at least these nine ones here. Um, so the, uh, the weakest one is actually unbreakability under a key-only attack, meaning you're given the public key and you're asked to find the secret key. Uh, and then you have unbreakability under a known message attack, you're given uh, 
um, uh, message signature pairs. And here, at CMA, you're given an oracle that signs whatever, whatever you want. And we have this column here, uh, where all the adversaries here are trying to recover the key. We have these, these adversaries that try to find this a signature on a randomly chosen um, uh, message. And we have existential uh, forgeries where the adversary can choose the message. So actually, if we look at Schnorr signatures, uh, we know that this is hard. Basically, this is a discrete lock problem. But we also know that these two notions are actually fulfilled um, under the one more uh, discrete lock assumption. Um, but actually, when we talk about these notions, they're not good enough to capture what we mean by what white box secure implementation. So we need to introduce something more, uh, basically known program attacks, right? So in a known program attack, it's actually what I've said before. Now, we're not providing the adversary with any signing oracle. We're just providing it with a program this time. And so this is basically um, unbreakability under a known program attack. Right? I give one program, I expect to see the signing key out of that adversary. And the first thing that you can see is that if you define that way unbreakability under a known program attack, there is an obvious connection with unbreakability under a chosen message attack. Why? Um, because essentially, if as an attacker, you can extract the secret key from the public key by just being given an oracle access to the signing function. Well, in particular, if you're given a program that signs, you can just do the same thing, right? Using the program in a black box fashion, the same way you would make a call to the oracle. Right? I'm not saying anything fancy here. It's very simple, right? So we have actually this reduction that uh, plays the role of the UBKTPA attacker, you give a program, and then the reduction just uses that as an oracle uh, to simulate the signing oracle to the adversary. So we can convert this adversary, uh, the UBKCNA, into a UBKTPA. Right? Okay. But now we come to the point where we need to make more precise what we mean by white box cryptomania. And white box cryptomania means that um, essentially, even if um, even if this notion here is actually strictly weaker than this one in cryptomania, uh, which means we're losing something from switching from an oracle access to the signing function, as opposed to a programmatic access, uh, if you will, uh, to the signing function. We don't want to lose anything either. We're not, in cryptomania, we assume that we're not losing anything, meaning that basically these two notions are equivalent. Right? So, in that world, oops, yeah, in that world, it has to mean that there is a reduction in the other direction. That there is also a, a security reduction that takes um, uh, a UBK TPA uh, attacker and that converts it into a UBK CMA attacker. <laughs> so there must be a reduction that does exactly that. You give it a public key, access to a signing oracle, and it converts an adversary that, given a public key and a program, returns the, the, the secret key, and the reduction completes the game here, returns the secret key, and has a certain success probability depending on the success probability of the adversary. So we assume that we must have some kind of a reduction of that nature. That's what white box domania here means. I mean. So now we're, uh, we see that um, we can actually build a meta reduction. So if you forget about the red part here, what we have here is exactly the same thing as in the slide before. We assume that there exists some that reduction 
that, that takes uh, the uh, UBK KP adversary and converts it to a UBK CMA um, adversary. So we assume that this reduction exists, and we can see that we can build a meta reduction that basically simulates the adversary here towards the reduction, simulates the challenger here, and will solve the following problem. So the meta reduction here, M, is given a random public key, is given access to a signing oracle, and will output a program. And the way it works is essentially, I mean, it's very easy to see, uh, the meta reduction just launches R, um, forwards the public key to R, every time R is making an oracle call to the signing function, it will just forward uh, the query to the signing oracle, and same thing for the output. And at some point, um, M will receive the input for the UBK KPA adversary, which is basically a public key and a program. So what happens now is that M, the meta reduction, will just stop and will output this program there. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Everybody seems <laughs> to be staring at the, at the screen. Okay, so if you take, so there are a few details in there, but if you take my word for it, this works. So basically what it means is that we now have a way, this meta reduction, if we assume white box cryptomania, it means we also have a, a meta reduction that transforms access to a signing oracle into an actual program that does the same thing. And that seems a very strong, very strong statement. So there is a, <clears throat> a small problem with what I said, which is um, I assumed that the public key that was given here was the same as the one that we, we forwarded to the reduction. And in practice, it could be different. I mean, the reduction could apply some transformation on this public key and provide a program that actually signs with respect to a different public key. And uh, so the meta reduction would not work because we're given a public key, access to a signing oracle for the signing key matching that public key. And essentially the reduction, we don't know how it works, but we just launch it and give us a different public key and a different program. So what can we do with that? Um, so we would return that program, but we don't know exactly how it relates to solving any problem with respect to the initial public key. Um, so this is where we need algebraic programs. So we're going to assume that actually the reduction here is algebraic. And algebraic is a very easy notion. It just means that um, an, algorithm, an algorithm that is algebraic over a group, um, at some point if the, this algorithm outputs a new group element, it must have been built from previously seen group elements with exponents that can be re reconstructed given the code the code, the precise code of the algorithm. So you can look at it like that. So at some point, so we have an algorithm, at some point you uh, run it, and as input there are a number of group elements, right? But if at some point this program outputs a group element, then it means that given the code that is between here and there, there is a way by just, uh, by just using that code to extract the exponents here. That there is, H was built by just composing the previously seen elements. And there is a way by just looking at the code uh, to uh, recompute exactly the exponents that were there. So actually there are, I mean, all the, essentially all the security reductions that we know are algebraic. And it's a notion that is very simple, uh, I mean, it's very simple to uh, to describe, uh, but it's actually more powerful than the uh, generic model. Okay. So now I come back to our problem with the meta reduction, uh, which is we're given a signature.